progress, right? Because we were trying and we kept trying and we would always end up point zero. So what is happening, okay? But the white brain computer said, he has weapon that can annihilate me. Must create weapon can do same thing. <laughs> so if you see this front view of the male genitalia, a lateral view would look like this. If you turn that around 90 degrees, it'll look like this. Can you see that? Can't see it. I'll put it here. Can you see that? What does that look like? A gun. Now look at what this gentleman brought. I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> Do you see this? He found this in a desk that he purchased this and, I, and he said here dr. Welsing this is what you're talking about this is a penis made like a gun I didn't make it <laughs> okay he didn't make it I told him I wasn't taking this through the uh, x-ray thing at the airport <laughs> Miss, we see something in your purse. <laughs> Imagine me trying to explain this, okay? You see, but somebody put this together. You see, penis as weapon. And I say <laughs> that this, do you see, this is why there are now 200 million Guns in the possession of people in this area of the world. 200 million in this society. And I say that those 200 million, they said that there has been like a 40% escalation in the possession of guns since 1985. And I say that it's probably related to the period of time when they started talking about the white birth dearth. Do you see white people not producing? And the times that they start talking about, uh-oh, we're really getting seriously outnumbered in this area of the world. And so the gun is to what? It is to counter the black male's genital ability to produce white genetic annihilation. Are you all following me? Well, let me just kind of go back a little bit. Because once I understood this with all of the talk about black genetic inferiority, that they were doing something and also teaching black people, if you are black, stay back, brown, stick around, yellow, mellow, white, right. And while they were teaching us hate blackness, hate it, wish you were white, they were on their side of the track doing something very, very significant. What were they doing? And this is a state where everybody knows about the capital of tanning. <laughs> as quiet as it's kept, tanning, when people whose skins are white and they expose themselves to the ultraviolet rays of the sun, they cause the cells that are called melanocytes. These cells have the job, everybody has them, whether they're white, black, brown, red, or yellow. But in people whose skins are white, the melanocytes don't work. White people call that a genetic deficiency state. It is called albinism. This is not Francis Wilson's language. They just never applied the language to themselves, okay? They had applied it to the white bunny rabbit, the white mouse, the white rat, the white tiger, the white snake, the white roach. They have white roaches. <laughs> they have albino roaches, and <laughs> they can't work too well in the light, and the brown roaches have to work and take care of them. <laughs> That's true. Okay. But Tanny, when I went to college, I remember
remember my first year at Antioch College, I was the only black girl in my class. And the first April on campus, I came back from lunch one day and all of these bodies were all over the grass. And I was in a state of culture shock. <laughs> I probably stood there like this, what are they doing? <laughs> they were what? Tanning. They were trying to tan. Later on, they would say, Francis, now I'm your color. How many people have experienced that? Okay? And we were busy, oh, I hate this color. Why the hell God have to be, make me this way? Can I be white? Help, help. <laughs> because I know that if I were in a laboratory working, I said, I think I want to be an instant billionaire. And I'm going to make three pills. One will turn you white tomorrow morning. <laughs> you take the second pill, that will give you white features. The third pill will give you long hair. Will I be a billionaire? Yes. <laughs> but we're going to get our heads together and correct all of that. But then I understood the tanning. And they were trying to make up for what was missing and projecting that something was wrong with us genetically, but they were feeling that something was wrong with themselves. I look so sick and pale. Somebody in my institute in D.C. brought an article in a newspaper. It was a white lady in a swimming suit, and in big print, are you too white to appear on the beach this summer? Come to the suntan parlor. This wasn't an ad created by black people. Are you too white to appear on a beach this summer? You see, come and get your color straightened out. Okay. So I understood that all that talking about we're genetically this and genetically that, And LeGrand, I pulled out an article that you did in Sepia Magazine, 1980. Go to the library and look up 1980 issue of Sepia Magazine. I forget the month. But LeGrand Clegg had written an, an article about black genetic superiority. Now, this is not to go out and say to white people, we are superior. We are. See, no, it's not about that. But being very scientific, how many people in this audience know that black children are born more advanced in terms of nervous system development than their white counterparts. See, go and get that information. It's very important to put that in your head. By the time the children are two years of age, that accelerated development has been reversed because by the time black children are two and three years old, they know to reject what? A black doll. Do you see? So that the brain computer is already being bombarded with su a sufficient level of information. You are black, but hate yourself. And it's that accelerated development that I would say white supremacy is afraid of, do you see? And so then it is reversed, and so then they say, oh, the black people have low scores, and the black people had the lowest math scores, and the lowest, it is because of the attack of racism on that highly developed nervous system that produces that end result. And the black people, if you really take a survey and you say, well, let's do a survey right here. How many people would like Mercedes if I bought some with me? A dealer gave me some. How many people would want one? Raise your hand. <laughs> right. It's a nice car, right? Some people have theirs already. <laughs> now just monitor your brain's response to the next question. And don't lie to yourself because it's the truth that will set you free. How many people think the black person sitting next to them can make a Mercedes? I told you to tell the truth because you'll get punished by the time you leave if you lie. of hands 
hands that went up sort of after a fashion, right? That if that number of people actually believed that, black people would be majoring in math and engineering and physics. No, I can't do math. Huh? I never was. <laughs> you see, aside from this culture maybe feeling that way, but we, what? You can't do that. I mean, it's just like when I went to college, the, uh, one of the counselors said, you know, I don't think you should do medicine. What about clerical? <laughs> okay? You see, I mean, this is, this is the way that people are steered. This is the way that we are made to think. There's a book that uh, I want to recommend to everybody. Uh, maybe Esawan will get it at their store. <laughs> it's called The Man Who Knew Infinity. It's about an Indian mathematician named Ramanujan. And he died at the age of 32. He was born in the late 1800s. And he was really one of the outstanding mathematicians of the 20th century. He, but if you look at him, you see, because there was, what, an African presence in India. The early Indians looked like the people in this audience, the black people, okay? The early Indian people were genetic offshoots from Africa. This gentleman looks just like a black person that you might see standing around anywhere. He has straight hair, looks black. His mother looks like anybody sitting on a porch in a poor neighborhood. One of the most outstanding mathematicians of the 20th century. He laid the foundation for all of the modern work that they're doing in physics and astronomy. Looking just like your average black person. Do you see? But if we, if we say, just put the question, well, what is the, you know, the smartest mathematician? What does he look like? An image of white is going to come into your computer. Do you see? Not the person sitting next to you. But this is training under white supremacy, okay? So then let's go back to the things that white supremacy helps us understand or the things that we can understand about white supremacy, and I call them the symbolic subconscious evidence that this, it, this system is what I say that it is. After I understood racism as the concern about white genetic annihilation, it also came to me because I was standing in my house one Sunday and it was so very quiet. And this is another point. You know how they want us boom, da boom, boom, da boom, boom, noise, right? That shuts the computer down, you all. But that's why they say, this is your music. So you're going to have to run some experiments and say, now let's see under what conditions does my brain computer seem to flow in the direction of solving problems. So I was standing in my house and it was so quiet and my brain computer was beginning to work at another level. And I said, what's going on? What's happening? And it occurred to me on Sunday and the ball games were going on. So I said, these ball games have more significance than we realize. And then it came to my brain computer that there were two series of ball games. What are they? If you already know, don't answer. <laughs> but to make a long story short, my brain computer printed out there two series of ball games in the white supremacy system and culture. And it just came in my computer, what? Big brown and small white. <laughs> And see, people are looking at it all the time, but don't, didn't see that. If you ask people, I don't care if you're talking at Yale or Stanford, or any, you can say, what are the two series of ball games in the white supremacy system and culture? Big League or National and whatever, American, na no. <laughs> the two series of ball games are big brown and small white. What's big brown? Football? Basketball, bowling ball, <laughs> soccer, small white.
ping pong. <laughs> Last night, somebody said marbles. <laughs> okay. Now, the men that are most virile play what balls? With what ball? The big brown balls. And what are these balls? And Bertha, don't get upset. <laughs> concern about genetic annihilation. And the culture gives us a hint. It says what? Keep your eye on the ball. S. <laughs> what balls? These balls. Is this a ball? I don't know, maybe it's not in California. <laughs> Do they call testicles balls? <laughs> these ball games are just symbolic of the concern about these balls. Keep your eye on the ball means watch out for white genetic annihilation. The same culture that said that lynched and castrated black men because they said what? He was looking at a white lady. He looked like he was thinking about looking at a white lady. He was looking at that picture of a white lady. I think he wanted to think about thinking. About thinking he wanted to think. enough to kill the black man. But as quiet as it is kept, what was the white lady saying was her ideal mate? Tall, blonde, no, dark, and handsome. Is that correct? Tall, dark, and handsome. And so then when we go over here and look at the symbolic evidence, we see in the symbolic evidence where these big brown balls go. The football goes into some white upright legs at the end of the field. <laughs> right? Of course. Do you understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? I didn't make this evidence. Just like I didn't make the evidence at Valentine's Day. I want some chocolate. <laughs> around Valentine's Day, you'll see in the food section, chocolate is erotic. Hey! See, now, black people, we just dance along, and I want some chocolate, too. <laughs> Not realizing that we already have chocolate, right?
see, and I'm not trying to be offensive at all, but this is the evidence. It's like the favorite candy. I was in Germany in 1957, and the favorite candy was little chocolate babies called nigger babies. Right. That was the favorite candy, and it probably still is. It's like the people here eating Mr. Good Bars, <laughs> chocolate, and nuts. <laughs> Babe Ruth. <laughs> See, like all of the favorite drinks are what? Dark brown. Coffee, tea. Coke. Chocolate, Coke. Germany, for example, at a certain point said, wait a minute, why are we drinking this American drink, Coca-Cola? We need our own national cola in Germany. So any sane person would think, well, they would come up with, you know, some clear water or <laughs> so, No! They came up with the German national cola, and guess what they called it? Anybody in Germany recently? Afri-Cola. <laughs> they were not playing about taking that brown substance into their body, and so it's like a Coke bottle, that shape, this dark brown material in it, and then a palm tree from Africa on it called Afri-Cola is the national cola drink in Germany. Okay? So, see, what we didn't understand, we thought we understood. See, it's not, you don't have to just read somebody's lips, you have to watch their behavior. See, that investigation, well, wait a minute, let's just see where these people are coming from. Let me just step back. What are they really talking about? And I say that's why they killed Dr. Martin Luther King, because he said what? Integrate. Little black boys and little black girls and little white boys. You see, love. Love everybody, but love in the arena of sex would produce, if everybody was mixing up, it would produce white genetic annihilation. Do you understand? He wasn't talking about guns. He wasn't talking about hate. But he didn't understand the fundamental issue. Do you see, like maybe Compton College or some of the schools out here, I am advocating now that instead of black people getting upset with some Nazis, somebody says they're Nazis and somebody said they're Klan, don't get upset. Say, well, we wanted you to give a lecture series on white supremacy. Invite them. Do you understand? Invite them. See, anytime what we were doing in the past, we hate black people, and black people like this, and we, oh, you don't like us. Do you see? But see, when you love yourself, you're just interested in somebody talking about, you know, oh, you say you hate us? Well, come and give a lecture because we are now approaching white supremacy scientifically. Wow. See, and just say, well, we're very happy that there's some white people who can be quite honest about what they believe. And so when they start talking about Aryan superiority and black people are a contaminant, hey, don't get upset. Say, well, that's what we analyzed it to be anyway. <laughs> but we just would like you to go through your whole lecture because we want to understand you better. It helps us organize our play on the other side of the court. Okay? But let me finish doing ball games. What about billards? All the people, all the black people, all the people of color in the world who were playing billards or pool didn't know that they were really engaging in white supremacy. I mean, playing out the symbolism of white supremacy. What is the symbolism? All these colored balls on the table, right? Long stick. 
This is a stick. This is a ball. Okay. Okay. Long stick. Take the rack off, and then the white ball knocks all the colored balls under the table. Right? At the end of the game, the white ball is sitting on the table. That's called white genetic survival. What's the last ball to go in? The eight ball, the black one. And what is the expression that goes with it? You don't want to get caught behind the eight ball. Meaning what? You, you know, if you were behind the eight ball, the symbolism that the white ball was behind or if the eight ball was victorious, that would translate white genetic annihilation. Are you with it? So you see, we're not going to be talking about what's happening anymore. The new greeting is, you do know what's happening, don't you? <laughs> You do know what's happening, don't you? <laughs> See, that would even change the community. What's happening? Hey, what's happening? What's, what's happening? <laughs> As opposed to, you do know what's happening. <laughs> people will be coming up to the black people at the water fountain and say, what were you all talking about? <laughs> well, we were just talking about what's happening. <laughs> See, not getting angry, because I'm not talking about hating white people, being disrespectful. That is not the way this problem is going to be solved. This problem is going to be analyzed and handled scientifically, okay? Okay, so what then are the implications? Well, let's just deal with concept and color of God. This is, I think, ooh, <laughs> critical. <laughs> that white supremacy, see, white supremacy really goes way back. We can say white supremacy goes back 2,000 years plus when Rome was invading Africa. Okay. I forgot my point. <laughs> oh, concept and color of God, right. That Rome went into Africa, and then they started talking about Christianity, right? But well, what color were the people here? I mean, now that there's some positive things that come out of every negative. That Persian Gulf War, were people looking at, were you looking at the TV and looking at the people? And maybe some of the soldiers came back and talked about how hot it was. The people over in all of this part of the world were black people. So the gentleman whose name is Jesus, he was a black person. <laughs> Feet of bronze, burnt bronze, woolly hair, lamb of God, anybody? Has anybody seen a lamb with straight hair? <laughs> the strange lamb, right? <laughs> we can also, we're helped. See, the way that the cosmos works is so fascinating because the cosmos, you can't really tell a lie. It reveals itself in some way. And so here's this man, his name is Jesus. And I say, if you break his name in the right place, you get just us. <laughs> So here he is over here, and the Romans had invaded Africa. They were oppressing the people. 
That's why they couldn't get any place in the inn. They didn't let colored people in the inn. Okay, so the people were following him, and so they said, well, wait a minute, these people are all going in this direction. We're gonna have to change the color of these people. So the color and the images that started being portrayed they just changed the image from black to white. But since, you know, lies can only be hidden for a short period of time, the holiest icon in the Catholic Church is what? The black Madonna and child. See, the real item that is hidden away, jewels and everything, the black Madonna and child. But if black people, and this is the significance of crystal black. If black people were worshiping the image of themselves, can you imagine where we would be? were worshiping black a lot of the marital discord <laughs> I mean even though you have white supremacy forcing us apart you see but we roll over in bed in the morning and look half awake is this you I'm next to <laughs> what am I doing in bed with this black person see after you look at TV and look at the magazines. That's why the little children at three, because I don't want that black doll. What do you think is in our computers really about ourselves? How many people are now in love with crystal black? Don't lie, because you'll get, you know, a bolt of lightning will strike you. <laughs> don't lie. All I need to do is go and find your children. When you're not around, and all I have to say, I'm not going to tell mommy and daddy what you said. <laughs> and then I give them a series of colors, little color circles on a board. And I say, what's daddy's favorite color? What does daddy think is pretty? What's mommy's favorite color? See how quiet look you all. Do you understand? Truth has come into the room. <laughs> See the vibe? Did you just see the vibe? Hey, hear me? No, the vibration came right on down. You see? So we don't have to lie to anybody. White supremacy is the dominant force on the planet with one-tenth of the people. Fewer than one-tenth of the people have white skins. Nine-tenths of the people on the planet Earth are what? Worshiping white. See how quiet it got? <laughs> See, but don't feel ashamed. Embrace yourself. See, just put your arms around yourself sitting right there and say, with all my faults, with all of my victimization under white supremacy, I love myself and am going to face the truth and get free. See, hug yourself, right? So, <laughs> They changed the image because I remember, see I went to, was baptized in the Baptist Church, Oliver Baptist Church in Chicago, and christened in the Quinn Chapel AME Church. And I was handed that little Sunday school card. My grandfather was head of the deacon and trustees board, so you know we were in the Sunday school early. <laughs> Got those Sunday school cards early, right? And that card of that white man went into my little brain computer. And I remember being a little girl, we had a pantry in our house where, you know, you walk into this closet kind of area and then it had all these shelves and the Quaker oats and the, you know, the food and the canned goods would be there. And I mean, I was little, you know, like I would be looking up at this shelf and I remember after I figured this stuff out about white supremacy, and then I said, wow, when I was little, I thought the man on the Quaker Oats box was God. <laughs> I mean, now look at the sequence. I had been to Sunday school, 
right? I've seen the picture of Jesus. This, boys and girls, is the Son of God. So I wasn't a stupido, <laughs> right? So I just, you know, and then your parents put the oatmeal on the table. Now we say to grace. God is great and God is good, and we thank him for this food. <laughs> well, that pilgrim father on the Quaker Road had provided it. And I said, well, he's just an older, so I guess this is, you know how children figure things out? They don't discuss it with, they just say, oh. <laughs> so I said, oh, to myself, this is his father. Now let me tell you, now you are saying she's really retarded. <laughs> let me tell you. Everybody in the audience, close your eyes right now. And I want to say a word, and you be honest, and you see the image that goes through your computer. Jesus. White image, right? I know it's white. Okay? Wait, well, wait, wait. Now, if your computer... See, I'm talking about it. I wrote about it. But it still flashes through because what? That's ground-in image. You have to be working day and night into counter racist consciousness and then it's still there. But you've got to work with it. But if that image passed through your brain as white, then you ask the average black person, what color is God? And then, God doesn't have any color. <laughs> brain computer flashed a white image of Jesus. See, the brain computer is already a hundred or fifty steps ahead. Logic steps ahead. I mean, these things were, you know, these are the computers that designed the IBM computers. So once that picture flashes white, your brain computer has already computed that the father was white because everybody knows if Jesus was white, he didn't have a black father. Do you all understand? Your computers understand that? So you just say, oh, that's significant. Because then black people put on a musical, arms too short to box with God. Translate, arms too short to box with white supremacy. Do you all understand? too short to box with white supremacy. All over this area of the world, in all the urban centers, young black people, young black men are killing each other up a storm. Killing each other out of pain and frustration and self-hatred. Because, what, as victims of white supremacy, we are afraid to box with the white God. Thank you. See the quiet of truth right there? Right. I'm afraid of them. I am afraid of them. I keep on stepping, but what, afraid of what they can do, but facing the fear and saying, the fear is not going to stop me, okay? But, see, if we don't face fear, see, you, if you say, I know I'm afraid, that allows you to step, continue on that line. If I'm afraid and I cannot admit fear, I make a right turn <laughs> away from the problem. Okay, so if we look at white supremacy like a chessboard, see, and, and go to work and at your desk, every time you sit down with a piece of paper, put a little chessboard to get your orientation. <laughs> see, the chessboard is just like white supremacy because, what, there's a white side of the chessboard, 
and a black side, right? And white always moves first. <laughs> Under white supremacy, that means white is playing offense, defense, and black has to play defense, offense, okay? So if we sit down here in, at this chessboard and understand that they are moving against us. And if I don't admit, see, we have to be able to admit, White has won the tournament for the last 2,000 years, you all. Okay? Now, if I, I can't say that, then I will make a right turn. Okay? So here we are on a black side of chessboard. Here's me. I should be looking over here. If I am afraid and don't admit it, I will make either a right turn or a left turn. And who will I attack? Somebody on my own side of the board. Do you follow me? Okay. See, better we say, I'm afraid. And they say, well, what are you going to do? Like a white banker said to me, I gave a lecture, you know, it was a Black History Month program in D.C., some big white bank institution, they had some black employees, they let them put on a Black History Month program. <laughs> <laughs> so they invited me and I ran my white supremacy racism thing, you know? and at the end of the talk, this blue-eyed, white-haired banker, this suit, you know, he came up to me and shook my hand and said, very interesting. <laughs> he said, you are right about what you say. But what can you do about it? <laughs> hey! Isn't that reality? Okay. He didn't know I was going to keep on trying. <laughs> okay. something about it if we prevent ourselves from making that right or left turn. See, in other words, if I say I'm afraid, if I feel afraid, and then I'm ashamed, as opposed to embracing myself, if I'm ashamed, then I will turn and look at the reflection of myself, and because I hate myself, and I'm ashamed, it will make me attack my reflection. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And so this is what we have to be aware of and have to start working on. Do you see, just embrace yourself. I mean, this was a colossus. We didn't understand where these people were coming from. Genetically dominant people can't even compute. Well, what are you worried about? Genetic annihilation. Do you see, but we got a little bit of that training because we learned don't marry anybody darker than yourself. Didn't we? Yeah. See, ask the little babies. Go to see the little newborn baby. You're looking in the glass. <laughs> I put this diagram on the board. <laughs> it's two little babies, right? In the nursery. And the nurses said, yours is right over there, but there are two little bassinets, right? So here's one little baby hair and a little straight hair, right? And one little baby hair has a lot of helix hair. You know, I didn't say kinky. I said helix, one of the most profound forms in nature. Helix, H-E-L-I-X. But what do we do? I don't think that one is ours. <laughs> Are you with me, ladies and gentlemen? Is that one? I think they made a mistake. She's holding up that armband. It's got our name on it. Taking this little baby home, thinking mistake. And then looking at the nail band, see how quiet it's getting, but this is truth setting us free. These little nail men, little tiny baby fingers looking. 
Looking at the ear, you all around. Pulling at this little stuff, right? do you think in the first year of life has been subjected to a perm? Yes. <laughs> you see, wait a minute. See, truth is going to liberate us. Embrace yourself, right? We didn't set this up. White supremacy set it up. White supremacy had us worshiping the fact that the grandmothers were raped. Light complexion came in because what? The master was roving. You see, I mean, don't, I mean, we've got to embrace ourselves because as long as we are denying reality, we cannot oppose this side. So we're going to love ourselves. But we are no longer hiding from crystal black. We're not going to hide from fear. We're going to look at it because, well, this is interesting. Like I tell patients in my office, don't call yourself names. I don't care what you're doing. Don't call yourself names. Embrace yourself and say, now, this is interesting. My behavior is interesting. <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating behavior. Dr. Welsing says it comes from white supremacy. <laughs> so, but we have to take 100% what responsibility for turning the behavior around. You see, but no, we didn't produce this chaos. They produced it, but we are going to change it. ourselves all the way and the white people do you hate us no we don't hate you all but we are going to checkmate your behavior <laughs> you know they say that what black people are the first people the mothers and fathers of everybody on the planet came from crystal black people okay Now, how many people had a grandmother that all she had to do was raise an eyebrow? I had one grandmother that would just raise an eyebrow. You got came to attention. <laughs> now, since we are the parents of everybody, the white are you going to try to kill us all? No. But we're just going to monitor behavior <laughs> like the grandparents, do you see? If we see them getting out of line and practicing some white supremacy and getting ready to do some devilment for white genetic survivor, we say, sit down. Sit down. Like the white people used to tell me when I was training in child psychiatry, Francis, you can get all the children well, the little white children and the little black children. But the little white children, I tell them what my grandmother told me, put your bottom in the seat and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to act civilized now. <laughs> but that's our job. Can we carry out that job running behind our children? Can we carry out that job running from truth? See, part of the problem, even with children listening to parents, if parents are running from the truth, not showing wisdom, the children say, look at these chumps, they're as silly as we are. <laughs> so they won't listen. So no, we are going to be leading this, talking about what? The elimination of white supremacy, establishing justice, so as to have peace on this planet. As Mr. Fuller will probably talk about, you cannot get peace without eliminating white supremacy. 
Do you see? Because that is the greatest evil. You've got the smallest number of people feeling that they have to mistreat the largest number of people so that they can genetically survive. So nothing can work out like that. Nothing can work out like that. The male-female relationships will not work until white supremacy has been checkmated. Do you see? It won't work. Because they keep having an action coming this way. See, they have an attack. Here's the black male, and here's the black female. One of the main methods of white supremacy is dividing and conquering. Keeping the black male from the black female. Okay? Unemploy him and you will put an argument in the household. Okay? So this force keeps coming this way. And by us holding on to each other, you can't stop this force. In other words, if a force is coming at you and you're just trying to hold hands and hold tight, the force will break right through that. Do you see? But if these people will oppose the force. Then they will stop the force from splitting them apart. But they have to, what, do a Nelson and Winnie Mandela. He fights it, and she fights it, okay? And that's what will bring them together, okay? But let me talk a little bit. Where is the time? I'm kind of confused about the time. It's uh, early. It's early. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the implications of this. White supremacy, I say, the thrust for white genetic survival, has to put its primary attack on the black man. It's an attack on non-white people in general, black people in particular, black men most particularly, because females cannot impose white genetic annihilation. Is everybody with that? Yeah. You really are? Yeah. Why? No. no, right, okay. The reason being, is that men, whether they are white, black, brown, red, or yellow, can impose sexual intercourse. A man can say, I want to have sex with you. You say no. If he was of the mind to, he could say, I'm going to make you. I have a weapon. Okay? No, everybody hopes that wouldn't happen, but he has that potential. If I found a man in the audience and I say, you are going to have sex with me tonight. <laughs> and he says, I have a headache, friend. <laughs> and then I say, I have my weapon. <laughs> See, physiology would what? He's a, he jumps into fear, and what will happen? <laughs> I mean, if a woman frightens a man, he will lose his erection, right? See, unemployment can cause impotence. So you know an M16 rifle or a big knife. <laughs> okay. So that is why, that is why very often, in a white job situation, they'll have a black lady, she might be a receptionist, and a black man is in a mail room. Somebody described that as at a lecture, that was what was going on on their job. Do you see what I'm saying? Because what? The black female does not present fear. And in addition to that, the white male, this is a little digression, digression, He's thinking, well, maybe I can get her in bed because white men say they are not men until they have had sexual intercourse with a black woman. Ooh, I don't know. That's what they say. Not what I told them to say, that's what they say, okay? That's 
what is played out in golf. Golf is a game that is played by what? The most powerful white men. How is that game played? Long stick held between legs. Those long sticks used to be carried by black men. Caddies, right? Okay, stick. Long stick held between legs. Little white ball. Now note how Michael Jordan takes that ball. <laughs> but here they go, putt. making a hole in one. <laughs> putt, 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 and where does the little ball go? The little white ball goes where? A hole. Where's a hole? In black mother earth. Okay. Okay, so let's go back at the implications. This attack on the black male, here's the black female and the black male. They have fallen in love, they say let's get married. Nobody taught them about white supremacy, but now the little children are going to learn about white supremacy when they're two and three months old. <laughs> See, we get real sophisticated. We'll be playing some tapes about white supremacy when the little baby's in the utero and the little babies will jump out talking about white genetic annihilation. <laughs> See, the people in the nursery schools are wondering, what are these children talking about? <laughs> okay. But if nobody teaches about white supremacy and how it works and what's going on. Like Mr. Fuller says, if you don't understand white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you, okay? But we are not taught about white supremacy. We're given Dick and Jane and Spot and Puff and whatever else they have going, you see? Not about racism so that these people fall in love and they get married but well, white supremacy is raining down. And it said, we've got to attack this black male because he might cause white genetic annihilation. That's, by the way, what sexism is about. You know, the white male holding the white female down? Why? Because she said her ideal mate was tall, dark, and handsome. And so if they were to let her go, my goodness, she would cause white genetic annihilation. <laughs> Now, gentlemen, let me just say this here. Don't mistake that to me, that you are supposed to join with her. <laughs> or ladies, <laughs> now Mr. Fuller will talk about <laughs> On the chessboard, see if we had this chessboard idea and we put nine areas of activity and so one of these columns would be sex and this last one would be war, okay. Under sex, the white lady makes her move on the board and she says to the black man in the college, aren't, aren't, you, aren't you in my French class? <laughs> study together. <laughs> See, because no black man makes the move to the white lady without her signaling. She's got to throw a signal that you can make that move. Okay. So she's been sent on mission. <laughs> but the counter-racist black man will say, you are beautiful. I have been trained to admire blonde, blue eyed white skin. You are so beautiful. But <laughs> I am on counter 
racist mission. See, that's an issue right here. <laughs> I am on counter racist mission. Cannot go any place with you without black lady by my side. just like a stun gun hit her. She says, this has never happened before. <laughs> so she asked him again, and he says, I am on counter-racist mission. Even though I admire you, have been trained for 26 years to love white. <laughs> Oh, and if you touch me with little white hand and a flick of your blonde hair, I might faint, <laughs> but will not go. So she returns to camp. <laughs> See, she went on a reconnaissance mission. <laughs> she reports to her battalion officer. No response. <laughs> okay. Back, <laughs> okay. No sexual intercourse, codification. Mr. Fuller, United Independent, compensatory code system concept to eliminate white supremacy. No sexual intercourse between black people and white people, non-white people and white people until who feel so inclined. Until white supremacy is eliminated from the planet. So the white lady or the white man, I must have you, I must have you. And so the counter-racist black person says, you must go to your community and stamp out white, white supremacy. You see, that will be a test of your love. <laughs> Neely Fuller had told me a long time ago, he said, Francis, if you want to see how this works, just run it out. I was up in Yakima, Washington, and this was a predominantly, you know, a few black people, mostly white, some years ago. And so I, it just occurred to me to say, no sexual intercourse between black and white people until white supremacy is eliminated. Mr. Fuller has said, just watch the response. And so I had never done that in a white audience. And some white professors were right in the middle of this center section. And I said, no sexual intercourse between white and black people until white supremacy is eliminated from the planet. These white men just, no, no. because it was exactly what he said <laughs> would happen. See, we have no idea how much of a motivation that would be. Mm -hmm. But here's this black lady and this black gentleman that white supremacy is hitting, unemploy him, force him out of the home, force them to argue you see, because they don't know that the force is out here and what? They turn right or left and look at each other. And the argument goes between them and they're calling each other bad names and tension. So she's left with the children, okay? He's gone. Or he might be trying to, I am a man and he gets three other ladies or something. <laughs> Not understanding this is white supremacy that has captured manhood and womanhood, okay. So here are the children, and so she's upset. Not with white supremacy because she didn't understand white supremacy. She's upset with him 
and then she reflects that to her attitude towards the male child. There you go acting like that, no good. Father, uh. She's not bad. He's not bad. What? We are victims of white supremacy. Didn't understand what was happening, okay? So she's shouting at the little boy. One of the things, he can get mad and then get angry, and then he goes out and becomes a rapist. What? I'm going to get me some love, right? Now I'm big enough. So that's one of the tragic outcomes. Another outcome, the little boy sees how mommy is relating to the little girl, and he just wants to be loved too. So mommy doesn't understand, daddy didn't understand, little children didn't, so he sees mommy able to relate to sister, then he says, mommy, can I put some fingernail polish on? Let me try your earring. Do you all hear me? Yeah. And so white supremacy says, fine. If he goes to jail, I got him where I want it. If he's surrounded by mother, auntie, grandmother, and sister, and I effeminize him, and move him on my scale to bisexuality and then homosexuality, I've got him where I want him, okay? See, they know their moves on the board. What are they playing? In other words, homosexuality, bisexuality, what? Moves towards genocide or if the males are thinking about having sexual relations with males, then there's no threat to what? White genetic annihilation. So they just have it for example. How many people saw Mr. Phil Donahue's show? It was in Washington a couple of weeks back. Some young black males were transvestites. They looked like beautiful women. And Mr. Donahue was, oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you're so beautiful. And the mothers were there. Oh, mother, and you're so proud. I'm sure you're proud of your son. Hey. The next week, Mr. Donahue had two black men, homosexual. They got married. Mr. Donahue was dressed in his formal attire to participate in the wedding. They kissed in the mouth. They held hands as they cut the wedding cake. And he sent them off on their wedding. And he was ecstatic. I wrote to him. you have sons, can you see yourself praising your sons for dressing like women? <laughs> you see? see, this is not a put down of anybody's sexuality. People don't choose their sexuality. They wake up and they find that they are programmed one direction or another, but by structuring households where the father is missing, you can effeminize the behavior of males. It's not magic. See, you can make a male start focusing on penis and mouth and penis and anus. Anus. Those are opposite ends of the gastrointestinal tract. That's the way the body feeds itself. We were sitting down at lunch and talking about, you know, how your body, your mind will say, you need some greens. Yeah. <laughs> how many people have had that experience? See, see if the father hasn't, see that whole thing of father holding.
holding the hand of a two and three year old male child, walking with that child, see the strength is pouring down his arm, through his fingers into the hand of the little baby. And teaching the little baby how the male wrist is supposed to move. And that little baby that didn't experience that, holding the hand of a mommy who might be 16 or 26, and grandmother, and auntie, and cousin, and so then somebody says they have a weak wrist. Do you all understand? So I said, can you see yourself praising your son? for marrying a male on, on television that goes all over the world. I mean, he was absolutely ecstatic. Mr. Neely Fuller said, what, a, what about if his son came home wanting to marry a black male dressed as a female? Now, can you see, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> Let's cut the cake. You see, but the television, it plays out. You know, everything that's on television is what? Geared to white genetic survival, preventing white genetic annihilation. You know, either put all the black men in prison, the ones that are left on the street, give them drugs that you have developed, ethno-specific drugs. <laughs> Well, let me just finish this, a female child. If the mother is trying to provide financial support and emotional support, what can happen to the children? She's tired. And so the children don't get enough lap time. That's not how many times you run around the track, as a little child told me. I said, how many people know what lap time in high school? Okay? He said, running around the track. No, that's sitting on mother's lap until the baby says, let me down. You know, little baby will say, okay, let me down. <laughs> See, if they don't get lap time, the end result will be alcoholism, drug addiction, or sex obsession. See, trying to get comforted as a human being, it's like a vitamin deficiency. So the little children who don't get lap time, like I tell all the little children, if you are engaging in sexual activity as a child, you are not bad. You are simply saying, I want my mommy's lap. See, I want to be close. I want to be close. So when we don't have the circumstances under white supremacy and that is produced, there's sex obsession, little children are having sex. I want to have your baby. If you love me, you have my baby. Yeah. You see, these are tragedies under white supremacy because children cannot take care of children. That's right. They cannot. <laughs> and so then they say, well, they have an epidemic of teen pregnancy. You're right. This is a symptom a white supremacy. And we didn't understand it, so we were falling victim to it. But now we're going to change it. That's right. Counter racist ladies, no children until 30. Ooh. We're not talking about what we want to do or what feels good. We're talking about prosecuting the war, right? Now, men, hold on. No children till 35. Ooh, ooh. No more than two, no closer together than three years apart. No, because see, white supremacy keeps saying younger and younger. When I started putting out these figures, some white person came along and said, you know, it's really did a study, you know, studies, grants and studies, okay? Did a study and said, well, it really is not such a bad idea for these black children to start having children because really there's not anything else that they're going to be able to do. Hey. So this is really one of the more constructive things that they can be into. 
And so now what are they doing in the schools? Putting nursery schools in the junior highs and the high schools? See, while the white people are going to be doing history, geography, and math, and then the Eastern Europeans are going to be coming over and entering the schools and doing history, geography, and math, and what are we going to be doing tending babies? Do you all understand? See that message, you're not going to be involved in the competition that's going on. No, we have a place for you. No education, taking care of babies. And as I was gave a lecture someplace and the teacher said, yes, that's right, they take a break at 10 o'clock to go to the nursery. And then there's a break at 2 o'clock. And then they take the babies home at 3 o'clock. Where is the studying being done if black people are going to have to be responsible for their own self-sufficiency and development? <laughs> you all, we better understand. And every baby that is sitting on the lap of somebody who is immature, not bad, immature, is going to be vulnerable to the stress of white supremacy and white supremacy said we got something for you we got every kind of designer drugs that we've made for your particular kind of nervous system i saw a tv program first saw it in canada and saw it in dc this this past week here are some scientists from the national institutes of health talking about drug abuse said so we are interested in the difference in different populations. Now they had little mice. We are interested because there is a difference in the way that different populations of organisms respond to drugs. So they had the little black mouse in his cage tapping the little lever to get his injection of cocaine, tapping it until he died. Then they had a little white mouse, albino mouse, little blue-eyed, white-haired mouse. <laughs> and they said some organisms can leave the drug alone. Do you think that people cannot create chemicals that are specific to the nervous system of highly melanated people? <laughs> See, we're going to change. You know, we were unsophisticated people, ever loving, ever accepting, not thinking. We are going to start thinking. Does anybody think, after they ran the Tuskegee syphilis experiment on black men, does anybody think that people would not sit in a laboratory and make a virus? You know, just like they were saying, it's you that's genetically inferior, and it was themselves. And then they, oh, this virus came out of Africa. Hey, it came out of your lab. <laughs> See, in the papers recently, big controversy, Dr. Gallo, the one who talked about the virus coming out of Africa. Now he's supposed to have been lying about having found the virus. One lie is always supported by a minimum of 25 other lies. Okay? I hope we got that. Did you all write this down? 30, 35, 2, 3. This might be the lottery number. But we better play it in real life. See, very serious. 
bankruptcy very serious. We have got to decree on the black side of the chessboard we are not putting any more black children in the foster care system, in the welfare system. <laughs> See, just ask the little children. They go through horror. They go through horror. See, nobody's bad who ever put their children in foster care, anything like that. But we didn't understand white supremacy then. We have got to understand it and understand what the home is the first teacher. The home is the first teacher. Right. <laughs> We cannot ask people in the school to what? Make up for what didn't happen in the first school. <laughs> See, knowing that it's white supremacy, any, when the information that black children are second to none from birth, so there's no excuse. But white supremacy says, I can't have them functioning at the highest level because they will threaten white genetic survival. And so we have to say, no, no, no. They are going to be the highest developed children second to none on this planet. And we are going to take responsibility to see that it happens, and we will be preventing AIDS also. Do you all understand? That's a part of the war. They ran here sex. We made them sex obsessed so we can put a virus out here that is sexually transmitted. And they'll be talking about they don't care. They got to get some. Get on up, sex machine. <laughs> so then over on the kind of racist side of the board, no, we say we are putting the P and the V under discipline. That's penis and vagina. <laughs> what are we doing? We're taking them to the library and putting them on a chair. <laughs> Take them to Esawan Books. in your own house at a chair and desk. See, we wanted to counter the white supremacists will be saying, God, they're buying books. <laughs> they're at the, the lot. Wait a minute. Uh -oh. We're going to have to send a whole battalion out here. We got to get them off course. Say, so, no, we understand white supremacy until it's over. We're going to bring this under discipline. See, you can't, if you mistreat children, and that could mean you just don't understand what you're doing as a parent, the children will come back and wage war on you. Which brings me to the point that that's what happened to our white children. Hey, human life began in Africa amongst black people. We produced some albino mutants and put them out of the Garden of Eden. Get out! <laughs> they had to go directly north to get out of the sun. Get out your map. I saw a nice one in S1 books. <laughs> directly north of Africa is what? Europe. Okay? And so they moved up here. We put them out because we said, well, you don't have skin color. It looks like something's wrong. <laughs> That's just like now. Child has a genetic defect. They put them where? In an institution. They isolate them. So these people were put out. And so then they say that their civilization started in Rome with Romulus and Remus. Read people, right? Romulus and Remus were doing what? Nursing on a wolf. Go to your Britannica. 
That'll be the easiest way. Just look it up. White people say that Western civilization began in Rome, 736 B.C. Romulus and Remus. And the symbol of Romulus and Remus were these two little children nursing on a wolf. A wolf is a canine, like a dog. They still say man's best friend is a dog. See, black people say man's best friend is God, and you turn that word around and you got D-O-G. They don't say bring the homeless black people in, it's cold outside. Well, you all don't have that problem here. See, but they'll say make sure your dog has all the vitamins, all the minerals to keep its coat, Right. Now, black people can be starving, right? Neely Fuller said on the plane, just struck me, Neely, he said, if somebody was going around killing all the dogs in a neighborhood, it would be all kind of protest. But people are just going around killing black people. No protests. Okay, but let me go back to my point. So Romulus and Remus, the little children that we put out, and I say to white people, maybe we were the first foster parents or abusing parents, and we're sorry. <laughs> but we're going to get your behavior straight. <laughs> so now look at what they did. At some point, they came back into Africa and started dogging the black people. Dogging, get that. Dogging the black people. Then they took the black people out and took them, some of them to America. And then they started...